Well, good morning again. Welcome to our live stream guests and members of Southside. Last uh, Sunday in April, next week we're going to partake of communion together, so be uh, prepared uh, for that next Sunday. We're studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans, and we're currently in chapter 2. So if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 2, we're looking at the gospel of God, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that he has given to us. So Paul's declared in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God to bring mankind into the, to the realm of salvation, which means they're outside that realm. Paul is now expanding on this gospel. He's laying it out in detail for us to understand uh, its fullness and its ramifications for our life and all of history. And so the question as we start is, where do you begin with the gospel then? And for Paul, he, he begins with, what do you need to be saved from? There, there's bad news. There's real news of your real condition. He's, de- he's dedicated three chapters uh, in his letter to this subject. And so our true condition must be known if we'll ever seek out God's gospel remedy in the right manner. A wrong diagnosis will never lead to true healing of being brought into the realm of salvation, the the kind of of gospel that God offers to us. So Paul began then by showing that the wrath of God in Romans 1.18 is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. So creation, uh, the revelation, it, it declares that there's a God, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. Uh, his divine nature and, and, and that he exists and he is. As you look at this world and what he created, it, it demands God be worshiped. But what we did is we, we took it and we suppressed it in our unrighteousness because we want to live any way we want. We want to do our own thing. Mankind didn't respond right, Paul said, by giving God glory and giving him thanks. Therefore, the wrath of God gave them over three times in Romans 1 to impurity homosexuality, and all kinds of evil, he said. And as they sin in the fullest measures, God gives them over to just drink up their sin and have it dripping out their pores and and just living in it. He says they give hearty approval then to those who do the same. They have parades and they go on TV shows and they make movies that just exalt immoralities and debaucheries and sin against God. And so this Romans 1 group applauds sin and they love everyone who joins them and and goes the same path. They're united in their wickedness. Well, last week we began chapter 2 and Paul is now switching from that group to now the religious hypocrite. The, the one who condemns those in Romans 1. Look at how bad they are. But, but they're the ones who don't deal with their own heart and their own life before God. He thinks that condemning others and teaching God's word and telling everybody what it says exempts them uh, that they are doing the very same things. They, they, they don't connect. There's a blindness and a hardness. And Paul asked them, Last week in verse 3, <clears throat> but do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you think judging others somehow makes you clear or clean when you're doing the same things? And the answer is no, that isn't going to get you out of the judgment of God. And in verse 4, he said the kindness and patience and tolerance of God is to lead you to repentance. And for you, it's doing the opposite. It's making you think that God doesn't care about your sin and he's okay with how you're living because you're pointing out everybody else's sin. Well, this morning, Paul's going to flush out that even deeper this morning in a very powerful way. The great physician God is going to give us the true diagnosis of our hearts. And I'll tell you this this morning. Coronavirus is a bad thing. And it has stung this church and this world severely. But this morning, I'm going to talk about a way worse diagnosis. A diagnosis that will bring with it a terminal declaration that anyone who has it will die. And the scriptures say that we're all born into this original sin. 
and they will die. And when they die, Jesus said they'll die a second death, which will be this eternal torment of Gehenna or hell that Jesus taught on often. So there'll be a second death for this one. And so the diagnosis in verse 5, if you'll look with me this morning, is where we left off, is because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart. That's God's diagnosis. What, what this disease has done and will do is it's wreaked havoc since its inception in the Garden of Eden. So the diagnosis is a stubborn and an unrepentant heart is the greatest problem of mankind. And that is what we need to deal with more than anything else while we are on this earth. So as we pray this morning, as I did pray, I'm going to remind you now that at the end of this sermon, I'll remind you again that the whole context here in Romans is salvation. Paul is telling you that God has a gospel. God has a salvation. And so we're digging in to show you that you need to be saved. And it, it's not to destroy you and leave you broken and dead. It's, it's to leave you in your true condition so that you might get saved. So I just want you to keep in your mind, this isn't to just make you grovel and see how bad you are, but it's to show you what you really are so you can get what God really has to save you. If you would listen to the great physician's diagnosis this morning and the terminal nature of it, and you listen closely to his remedy, it has a 100% cure rate. Jesus said all who come to the great physician will be healed. There's a healing remedy that works for every sinner who comes to Christ. Jesus said all who come to me, I will never cast out. So there's a 100% cure rate for the condition if you'll come to the great physician with the diagnosis this morning. That's the best news you could ever hear. And I want to start this morning with the right context. To have your, your heart x-rayed in this passage. And go to the one who said, I will give you a new heart. I'll take that stony hard heart and I'll give you a new heart that delights to do my will. And so I just want to show you the x-ray of the heart this morning. And so my prayer is, don't fight the diagnosis. It's an eternal mistake, and I watch people do it on a daily basis. I, I don't want that diagnosis. And you've you got to hear God's diagnosis. The one who made you is telling you what is wrong with your heart. So I want to go before God, and I want to pray and ask him to meet us with this x-ray this morning. God, do an x-ray through your word. Show us our hearts. Show us the condition. Show us even as believers where flesh has grown over our hearts and made us critical and uh, hypocritical. God, I pray, just cut it off. Cut off this overgrown flesh and let every heart just be sensitive and supple and humble before their God this morning. And I just pray for anyone who's come that is not a Christian. God, let them hear your diagnosis and, and hold still and not fight it. Let it be the word of God only and no thoughts from this pastor. God, I pray that you will do your work now. Move mightily in our midst, we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Here's your outline. Paul's going to give us three truths to understand this judgment we're looking at at the end of history rightly. The first one, is he says there's a certainty of this judgment. And then secondly, he's going to show us a comprehensiveness of this judgment. And then thirdly, what is the criterion that God uses in this judgment day? <clears throat> so first, let's look at the certainty of judgment, if you'll look with me in verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So this word, but because, is the, the connection is so important here in verse 5, because this is the, the cause. This is the cause of verse 4, that you despised the kindness of God. That Greek word to despise means to think lightly of it. You, you thought lightly of God's kindness and forbearance and patience with you. You, you, just, you, didn't, you didn't respond to it rightly. You didn't think rightly about it. You kind of just had light thoughts about it. And the reason you did is because you have a stubborn and an unrepentant heart. It's called hard-heartedness. 
It's, it's a calloused heart. It's insensitive. Uh, it, it's, it's not irreligious. In this section, it's religious. But it's unresponsive to the kindness of God in Christ Jesus. Throughout the Old Testament, it was called an uncircumcised heart. It was a heart that didn't respond to God's kindness and tolerance and patience that he kept showing Israel. And in the New Testament, Jesus takes the hardness of of, of heart and he he brings that phrase together. Mark 3, 5. After looking around this crowd with anger and grieved, it says, Jesus, at the hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and he was instantly healed. There was a hardness of heart. It's it's an unyielding heart. It's a defiant heart heart. It's a cold heart. It's unwilling to be taught. You're not going to tell me my diagnosis. Paul said it's an unrepentant heart. The kindnesses are being poured out and this hard heart will not repent. It won't have sorrow over grieving God and sinning against him and turn to him for, for his salvation and for his forgiveness. It just won't do it. It's just hard. What a condition. This is the worst condition you could have, a hard, unrepentant heart. You just won't repent. The mercies of God cannot melt your heart. You look at them and you hear them and they just won't melt. You have so much privilege, church, your whole life. You got a Bible. You go to studies, you were brought up in Awana and backyard Bible clubs, and your parents taught you every day. But you won't repent and turn to God in faith with a whole heart. You just take all your knowledge and beat up sinners and judge them and tell them of the wrath of God. And you look down at them with a contempt. The world is just so bad. And you look at all the kindnesses of God poured upon you daily. And they don't make you kind. Like we read in Matthew 25 with those who are sick and in prison and you care. You're just mean and judgmental. This message is for you. Therefore, in verse 5, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath. You're storing up wrath not reward. God isn't smiling at you because you know the Bible and can point it out at everybody. The Pharisees were so offended when Jesus called them to repentance and be saved. And he received harlots and tax gatherers who were repenting and coming to him for salvation. They hated it. They thought Jesus would come and say, what a good boy you are. You guys are so religious and right. They hated him so much they had to kill him. Because they they despised his message. Just another boomerang. You think you're storing up reward by by teaching God's word and condemning everybody and, and just pointing them out while you're doing the very same things. You're not storing up reward. You're not going to get a well done. It's just the opposite. What you're going to get at the end of it, he said, is wrath. It's a tough section. There's just boomerangs all over this. Every day that you look at the kindness of God and refuse to repent, you make a deposit into your account called God's wrath. And the interest accrues and it compounds daily. This debt is nothing compared to our national debt. It's way bigger. All day long. God says, here, breathe my air. Feel my sunshine on your face. Give you a job to take care of your home, a house or food or health. Hearing about the cross and what Jesus did for you. And I won't repent. I won't turn with my whole heart to God. You just make another deposit every day into this account. And it's going to come at the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. It's, this judgment is going to be righteous and it's going to be right. It's going to be done in truth. It's going to be revealed. 
In Romans 1, I want you to go back and remember it said the wrath of God is being revealed against us. It was a present tense. It was going on right then. And it was God giving you over to your sin. Here you go. You don't want me? The present tense, my wrath is just letting you go into sin deeper and deeper and deeper. But this one is you're storing it up for an appointed day. And it's the last day when it will be revealed. Romans 1, it's revealed, you see it, it's sin, you're drinking it up. Romans 2, it's stored up and it's being re- going to be revealed at the last day on the judgment of God, the righteous judgment of God. And here's the problem, you can't see that. I can show you a world in America right now of the, of the sin that's just growing and increasing and I can show you evidence of Romans 1. But I can't show you Romans 2 except in this word that there's an account with wrath being built up every day waiting for the last day. So there's wrath right now for those who reject God of just sin. And there's a day for the righteous, the self-righteous, where you're just accruing and accruing and you can't see it. And what you think is God is happy with you and what's being stored up is just the opposite. So you interpret that As God doesn't care that I play around with all my sin and do the exact same things that I'm judging everybody else for. Profess Christ and live any way I want. God judges bad people. He likes me. Look at all of his kindness. It's still on me. I got a job. I I got health. I drive a Mercedes. I've got it all. Paul's argument is so powerful and clear. He says, you will not escape. There's a future wrath being stored up that's going to be poured out on that last day. And don't mistake his kindness and his tolerance and his patience that he doesn't care. But his mercy, this is a mercy so that you would repent and believe and be saved from that horrible, horrible day that's coming. This is, this is mercy of why he's not just destroying us today. And don't misinterpret God's kindness and patience. It's misinterpreted. There's, I've never seen anything more exegetically wrong than how we interpret his, his mercies that we can just keep sinning instead of repenting. Religious hypocrite no heart for God, no concern for holy living. That's who I'm dealing with. No holding this word up to your own heart. Oh God, lead me in the paths of righteousness. There's none of that. There's going to be a payday one day. The day is coming. And you can do all you want to ignore it and act like it isn't going to come. God says it's coming. The kindness of being born into a nation It's had the light of the gospel since its inception and freedom. And churches and preachers and faithful friends and grandparents who have shared with you. Every day just keeps passing. And you won't repent. God is begging you, how much more kindness do I need to show you to bring you to repentance? I've withheld nothing. I even gave you my own son. I've given you everything for life and godliness. What more do you need to just repent and turn to this kindness of God that he's offering to you in his son? He's just patiently waiting while you take these gifts from God and you give him the finger and you worship idols instead of him. You take my word and you beat people with it and you won't repent and come to me. I haven't used this word for a long time. You're just a gnarly dude. That's what you are. My judgment day is coming. It's coming, God said. There's a certainty to it. And the whole Bible declares this future day as a certain day. And the religious churchgoer And the doctrinally correct man, the Calvinist, will not be given partiality on this day. But rather wrath, because you won't repent from your sin 
and turn to the living God. All the theology of God's kindness didn't lead you to repentance, but a critical spirit and a hardness of heart and a mean, nasty demeanor. That's what his kindness has brought you. What a diagnosis. What a disease. I'm telling you, this is way worse than a virus. Are you hearing this? Are you saying, I'm okay? You're okay? I can handle this? I want a second opinion. <laughs> my secular friend and my psychologist said that isn't true. My real problem is my dysfunctional family. I just want, I'll do it another day. I want to enjoy this life. I don't, I don't want to think about this. I don't, I don't even know if there's really a physician. I know my heart better than you. That's not true. I want you to hear the kindness of God to warn you about a future day this morning. This is his kindness. There's a judgment day coming. And the divine physician has diagnosed you here this morning. And you're saying, no, I will not repent. You just made a huge deposit this morning into that account. Because it's as if God is begging you through me this morning to repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And you won't. God is telling you the certainty of that day. Your account is building and building and accruing and accruing. And it's going to be poured out for all of eternity. For those who reject this kindness. I hate to tell you this, there's two more points. <laughs> there's a certainty to judgment. And now I want to look at the comprehensiveness of judgment in verse 6. This righteous judgment of God, he will render to each person according to his deeds. So it's, it's comprehensive. It's each person. It's going to be universal <coughs> and it's going to be individual. Everyone who's ever been born will be judged. And there's a divine day of reckoning then for every one of us. No one is ever going to be exempt or get a pass or get out of jail free card. No one is ever going to be exempt. And I want you to hear from God instead of me. Ecclesiastes 3.17 I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. Romans 14.10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Which is what's going on in this passage. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give an account to himself, to God on that judgment day. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with the angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Everyone's going to be judged. We're all going to have our day in court. Each one, and it's going to be very isolated and very personal. You're not going to be judged as a church. You're going to be judged single file. Each one of us will have a pure, undistracted dealing with God. And we're not going to be judged by the character of our church or our parents or our friends, what we approved or disapproved. He says it's going to be a judgment according to truth. The facts, just the facts. And it will just be you and the way you lived your life appearing before his all-knowing and piercing eye and remembering eye who will forget nothing. All of it will come before us to judgment. It's a powerful, powerful truth. Hebrews 9, 27, And as much as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So there's the certainty of judgment. The comprehensiveness of it is everyone, individually, 
will stand on this day. And now this third point is, is powerful. The criterion for judgment. And it says in verse 6, according to his deeds. Jeremiah says he will give to each man according to his ways. So how is this going to pan out? In verses 7 through 10, Paul's going to explain it. <clears throat> the character of judgment is going to be according to the character of our lives. There's only two outcomes that can come from this judgment. I like when it's simple. Just two. But the problem is they're polar opposites. And they're, they're really why I have given myself to ministry till God calls me home. Because these two extremes, they're so opposite that I want to spend all of my days trying to get people into this realm of salvation and out from the wrath of God and the judgment day that's coming. There's eternal life with blessing beyond compare. You cannot use hyperbole to the greatness of what is laid up for those who have longed for Jesus' coming. It's going to be unbelievable what God has for his people. And the other one is eternal death. Punishment beyond compare. All of that stored up wrath that he's talking about all of the kindness that God has poured out on you, that wrath now is going to be unleashed. And there's no way to use hyperbole towards its terror or horrors of what will come to those who get this judgment. Every soul is going to have a judgment. And every soul is going to go to, to one or two of these places. You're going to go to one or the other. Every soul, either eternal heaven or eternal hell. There's only two places. And so I'll tell you this. I had all this thought about how to handle this pandemic. And there's just so much out there. there it's a trick. It's a scheme. <laughs> there's a better way to handle it. Maybe there is. I sure am glad I'm not <laughs> having to make that decision. We need herd immunity. That's what we need. Have you ever, ever thought about the cost to the economy? How many people are going to die from that? Versus how many if it's just left alone and the articles and the commentaries and the news and, and Facebook and all these things just keep talking about this again and again. But I'm going to tell you this this morning. When I hear 60,000 deaths are not a big deal, tears just well up within me. And when I hear about all the suicides that will come from this pandemic, and someone says that's small compared to the two million deaths that could have been, tears well up. How many are going to die of starvation in third world countries? I hear people talking loose about lives that are going to die and stand in judgment with an eternal state. And wherever they go, they stay there forever. There's no second chances. I say this pandemic is not the most important thing in this world compared to the eternal destinations of where everyone is going to go. I've never had my eyes more stamped with it everywhere I'm going. That's all I can think about. People are dying, and where are they going to go? Get caught up in that. Give your life to that. I read a stat, uh, there's a 100% chance that you're going to die. There's a 100% chance that you're going to stand in judgment. And there's a 100% chance that you're going to go to heaven or hell. This diagnosis, hard heart, is way worse than positive for COVID-19. And all I hear is people dying without the salvation that God has brought about. And it's being freely offered to all. God's gospel. I pray that God would use a pandemic to wake this world up to something bigger than this earth that's passing away and will never bring you true happiness. No government's ever going to work. Okay, just come to grips with it. To a God who offers you a remedy and a cure for eternal life with him where moth and rust and virus can't touch it. That's for free. 
Let's look at the character of this judgment together then. Look with me in verses 7 through 10. This is what is called a chiastic structure. And so it begins in, in verse 7. For, for those who seek for glory, honor, and immortality, they're going to have eternal life. Then in verse 8, those who are selfishly ambitious, they do not obey the truth. There's going to be wrath and indignation. Verse 9, the soul that does evil, there'll be tribulation and distress. And then the chiastic structure in verse 10, for those who seek glory, honor, and peace, and everyone, <coughs> excuse me, who does good. So you got the, the good in 7 and 10, the bad in verses 8 through 9. And as we look at them, I want you to remember this again. <clears throat> I got to keep repeating this. Paul is dealing with the stubborn, unrepentant heart, passing judgment on the very same sins that they're doing, and they won't deal with their own hearts. God's kindness and patience is making them think it's okay to keep living this way. That's who we're looking at. <clears throat> so let's go uh, to the positive. I, I like positive, believe it or not. It's my favorite. Positive in verse 7. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. This is not a hypothetical. This is the way it is. This is how it's going to be worked out on the last day. <clears throat> These ones are described by what they persist in and by what they pursue. This is a, a, a one who perseverance in doing good. <laughs> I, I've tasted of God's goodness and I just keep persevering in doing men good. And I just want to tell you that is this church. I just, some, some uh, one of the ladies in the church told me that this group showed up with a violin and came and sang her hymns to encourage her during the coronavirus. Drive-by birthdays with hundreds and hundreds of people and meals and money and cards and errands and the list of people who volunteered, puzzles, gifts to the sick people. I had a couple, they, they lost their job. They wanted to go help this one family uh, who was sick and they, they go over to help them. And the, the family that's sick gives them a bunch of money because they heard they lost their job. You're, you're just fighting to outdo one another in love. Yes. <laughs> that's what we're looking for. Uh, just those who keep persisting and doing good because they've tasted of God's goodness, you can't kill it. You, you can't get quarantined and get mean and nasty and stop. All I'm hearing, everyone I've talked to, is you're just blossoming. And you're, every, every question is, how can I serve? Who can I help? What can I do? This is just beautiful. This is what God's talking about is you guys, the ones who just keep persevering and doing good in love because of the kindness of God that's been shown to you in the gospel, it never runs dry. It can't, it can't stop. I urge you by the mercies of God to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. His kindness, his mercies are fueling a life that just will not stop in seeking to do men good for their souls and with this gospel and their needs. And it's just, it's, it's so alive. This is what happens with the gospel. That's who Paul's talking about, you guys. This is their pursuit. This is what they're all about. What, what is your aim? What are you fixed on? <clears throat> I, I want you to answer this with Judgment Day honesty. What are you fixed on? Paul says it should be glory and honor and immortality. That I, I'm no longer an earthworm that just thinks about life here and what I can get. My, my chief end is I'm, I'm shooting for glory and honor and immortality despite my feelings and difficulties and pandemics and wildernesses. I just keep persevering in it. This is a present tense participle. You just keep persevering and doing good. You don't stop. It's who you are. It's your, your new nature. And you just keep going. The word glory. What glory are they after? This glory here is, it's, it's there to, to have Christ-likeness. My, my goal is I, I want to be made like Christ. I want to be glorified at the end of this race where I, I have no more sin. I get to see God. I get to be with God. I get to be like Him. I get to enjoy Him. That's glory. So our ambition is Christ and being glorified in Him and with Him. That, that's our chief end. It's not him with the most toys wins. It's not America. It's not this place. We have been born again to the things above. 
And, and so we're running this race going, glory, glory. That's what I'm after. And, and, and if I lose things on this earth, I'm not undone because my chief end is glory. And I can suffer here and I can be distressed and I can lose things because my reward is glory. This train is bound for glory. <laughs> Don't take nothing but the righteous and holy. And the other is honor. And I want you to hear this. We're seeking honor from God. And what we're asking is, I want to finish the race. And I've heard this from so many of you. And all I want to hear is well done. That's the honor that I want to hear. I want to run in such a way that when I get to the finish line, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. God is pleased to honor his servants. Listen to what he said in John 12. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I want the approval of God. I want those words. And so, so these are the ones who never get moved away from your chief end, is glorifying God and hearing the words then, well done, and seeking to glorify me. Well done. Don't get over that. And they're, they're the present tense, they're, they're pursuing after also immortality, which is what I preached on Easter, as you're longing for that day when these, these bodies will be raised from the grave and our perfected souls will be joined and we dwell on a perfect earth with a perfect Savior for all of eternity. That's my hope. My hope isn't my 401k. My hope isn't how this country is going to come out of this coronavirus. My hope, it isn't even in my, my wife my children. My hope is in immortality with God forever. He says eternal life. That's our reward. So I want you to get this. It's, this is perseverance in that. He doesn't say perfection. And I need you to get that because the sweet saints will beat yourselves and put yourself in Romans 2 this morning. We persevere in these things and we get distracted and we sin and we fall off, but we're repenting ones because of his kindness and we get back on that path and we keep running. And so what this is, is perseverance, not perfection. I blow it more than I do. Come on, persevere for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Aim for it. This is the obedience of faith. This is the one who, who, who runs and obeys in righteousness because he believes the gospel of the kindnesses and the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. So what do we get? Look at verse 10. We get glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so you get the divine shalom. You get wholeness and wellness and relationship with God and fellowship and a, eternal peace. So you get eternal life with eternal peace with the eternal God forever. That's what you get for the one who never gives up, just keeps running and persevering because of what God's done in their heart. They just keep going. And you're going to get, your reward is going to be a million times better than the cost. And, and I just wanted to pull out an example. And my example is Jeannie Tiffany. And I watched a woman who never gave up, and she just kept loving. And since she has passed, I have heard from people all over the, the country of how she touched them and impacted them. And she came, and she, she just, all she did was love people here till she went home, from what I'm hearing. That's what this looks like. And she just kept loving because God loved her. That was her motivation. God loved her in Christ, so she never wore out. And, and now she has eternal shalom. <laughs> There's an earthly picture of what I want for every one of us in this church. All right, second one then. Let's look at the character and conduct of the other side. Look with me in verse 8. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so these ones are 
contrasted by what they seek as well. This is what they persevere in, present tense. They never stop. And what it is, is they're selfishly ambitious. <laughs> a day in America. The word, uh, Greek word referred to a day laborer or a hireling. And a hireling or a day laborer, they just, they don't care about the company. They don't care about the business. I just come, give me my money so I can go buy my food at the end of the day. I only have one concern, me. And he says, this is those that all you care about is you. I, I come to church so everybody can serve me. My whole life is what have you done for me lately? I just, I'm just selfishly ambitious. I'm going to succeed and accomplish everything in my job, this world. I, I, it's all about me, me. Instead of seeking for glory, you seek for vain glory. The, motiv- the motivating principle of your life is me, me, me. I did it my way. Seeking my own ends, even your religion was for me. Even the law of God is a weapon to hurt other people. I seek my well-being and my glory over everything else. It's just all about me and instant gratification and mindset. It's the opposite. These are polar extremes. One, glory, honor, immortality. This one, selfish ambition. It's the opposite of one who denies himself all of his days in serving God and doing other people good. I was just thinking about my elder meeting this week. And in the middle of it, I just thought to myself, why do these guys do this? <laughs> it's just hard. And it's long hours. And it's denying and sacrificing for the good of this body. And, and uh, seven of them don't get paid to do it. And I'm like, what, why do they do this? Because they've seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and his kindnesses. And they want to pour out and spend themselves in being kind to others until they die. And I praise God for those men. Verse 9, every soul of man who does evil. Verse 8, they don't obey the truth but unrighteousness. Chapter 1, what did they do? They suppressed the truth in what? Unrighteousness. Chapter 2, same thing. It's unrighteousness. To be under sin is to have no regard for the truth, just self. What's the recompense? Wrath. That is the strongest kind of anger in the Bible. Indignation, it means man breathing violently while pursuing an enemy in great rage. Tribulation, the root meant extreme pressure. Distress meant a narrow place and it came to mean confinement, isolated and lonely for all of eternity. It's just the opposite of peace or glory. But everlasting destruction away from the favorable presence of God, but his wrath for all of eternity. Two destinies based on two characters of life. Selfishly ambitious or just wanting to hear well done. God's going to render judgment. And God is being kind this morning by telling you this and warning you that this is what's coming and this is, this is the only destinations. I was thinking about danger signs this week and I remember as a kid, the one that said high voltage and I, I couldn't read very well and I touched it and it, 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 I should have listened to the sign. How about tornado warning or poison? Don't scare people. Get rid of those signs that make me afraid. The coronavirus, what was thrown at us, just fear. Don't scare people. Let's just take down all the signs, right? Put up flowers, light music. You know, I, when I go to my dentist, there, there's this nice running music with uh, running water with soft music as they're about to drill through your tooth. <laughs> Doesn't work. I don't think you should talk like this, Pastor. It's making me really fearful and even uneasy. You're okay, I'm okay, let's move on. This warning's by God, and it's His mercy. This is the mercy of God to tell you and to warn you. This is another kindness given to you this morning. To warn you of this coming day so that you will seek out a true remedy for this condition. 
Changing the sign won't work. Taking it down won't fix it. Just preaching on the love of God. He just is a big love cloud. Don't worry about it. It's not right. That's not love. The love of God has given us books like Romans with warning signs. So please hear this. Right now, you're an object of God's kindness. <laughs> his tolerance and his patience. You have an opportunity this morning by hearing a sermon about the coming judgment of God and the wrath that you're storing up. You've been given Bibles to know God's heart. So whether you're sitting here right now, smirking, saying this guy needs to get out more, the quarantine's messing with him, I'm struggling and I get Jonathan Edwards on a Sunday morning. Or you're tearing up, broken over your stubborn and unrepentant heart because all the kindness that God has been showing you and it's been leading you to sin instead of repentance. God's telling you there's a day when my kindness and tolerance and patience, it will come to an end. And if you continue in this state, you will only be an object of my wrath for all of eternity. What will you do with the kindness of God to you again this morning? Are you going to hide in self-righteousness and say, I'm okay, I'm a good guy? Judge others while you keep doing the same? Or will you let his kindness lead you to repentance this morning? It demands a response. Salvation this morning? Or you're going to make a massive deposit into your wrath account. So to close out, I'm going to share some more with you about the kindness of God in hopes of your repentance. That's what I want this morning. So I want you to listen because so much is at stake here. There's an escape from verses 8 through 9 of distress and tribulation and wrath. There is a way out. And it's not by good works. It's taught everywhere in this world. There's not something you can do to get out of this place. You can't climb out. The wrath of God is upon you for one sin. You can't get out. A little, little religion can't get you out of this hole. Approving what is right and condemning others isn't going to get you out of the hole. The escape is outside of you, my friend. You can do nothing to fix this problem this morning. And you've got, you got to own that. The gospel begins with realizing I'm in this place. God's diagnosis is right. i got no way to get out. And my two favorite words after Jesus in Romans 3.21 is the words, but now. And so they're, 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 Paul's painting this picture of, of doom and gloom of your condition. And he's going to come and say, but now look what God has done. God in history has made a way of salvation. And so, but the first step is where Paul has begun. Confession and agreement that this is what I deserve. I deserve the wrath of God. I used to think God would never send me to hell. I was just too good of a guy. There's no way. Hell was for everyone else but me. But when salvation came into this heart, I suddenly saw what I had done with the kindness of God and all of his patience toward a sinner like me. And then I knew I deserved the wrath of God. Hell was the right place for a guy like me. And then I just wanted that wrath off me. And I tried so hard to change and start doing what was right. I went to church and I, I bought a Bible and I started reading it every night. Get the wrath off me. I started trying to quit sinning. Just didn't go well. But there was something I could not get out of my heart and my mind and my conscience. I deserved wrath. And no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't get it off. And I had so much guilt and condemnation, and it was starting to kill me. I was just, 
Everywhere I went, that guilt was weighing on me. And then came to Romans 3. And I want you to hear this. No, no matter how much you've stored up in your account called wrath, some of us were a little better than others at storing up. And, and I'm going to tell you, if you've been doing it, you're only two years old this morning. Or if you're 80, and you've spent 80 years of defying God and storing up, I want you to hear the message of all messages. There's a way to empty your account. And in Romans 3, there's a word called propitiation. And that word means to appease the wrath of God. And Jesus Christ went up on a cross and all the things that we did called sin that were accruing wrath were put upon Jesus. And God pulled out his sword of justice and his wrath was poured out on his son for three hours as he hung on that cross until Jesus drained every last drop of God's wrath. He, he emptied my account by taking the sin, the, the punishment for my sin on a cross. He, the kindness of God is that Jesus drained my wrath account by being the bullseye of that wrath from his Father. And when that gets into a heart, it's all over. You'll never be the same. You'll persevere in, in, in glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. And you'll never stop doing good because of the good that he did for you to empty that account. So take the diagnosis. <laughs> take it. Hardness of heart. And then take the Savior that God has offered to all who will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let his kindness lead you to repentance and not to hardness of heart and sinning and thinking God doesn't care. I pray that you would repent and turn to God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and be brought into the safe place called salvation. So my point here, the knowledge that Christ plucked you from his furnace gave you eternal peace and glory with the Father, hasn't changed your pursuits and passions, not perfection, and you haven't come to Christ, you've only come to church. And I don't want anyone to stop short of Christ. If there's religious hypocrites in our midst this morning, I want you to come all the way to Christ, all the way to Romans 3.21. Don't stop short of just judging unbelievers with the word and approving of what's right in his word. Come to Jesus and find the salvation that he offers to all who will come to him. So two responses, an unbeliever. Let his kindness lead you to repentance this morning. And for a believer, uh, hypocrisy is different than being a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a present tense. This is what you are. A believer has hypocrisy in his life that he's trying to let the light burn and change and transform. Perseverance and righteousness, because you are a child of God. I pray this morning, let his kindness lead you to repentance. If you've started just thinking God doesn't care that I keep looking at my pornography or overindulging or whatever it is, if I just keep thinking that his patience is he doesn't care, man, I pray this morning that God shook you like he shook me and said, Repent. Repent. Don't, don't misread my kindness. And my patience. God hates sin. Lead me in the paths of righteousness this morning. Let that be your response, child of God. That's how you know you are a child of God. Let that lead you to repentance this morning. And as we close out, one last thing. So sorry. But I just, I, I'm going to throw this out and I'll flush it out next week. I'm, just, I'm so worried about the character of my works and my life. Will, will I be judged by them? Absolutely, yes. Will I be saved by them? No. <laughs> this whole book is you're saved by the work of Jesus Christ alone. That's the only way to ever be right with God. So what is this about? Well, the faith that saves is a faith that works. It's the obedience of faith. 
If you get this gospel and the kindness of God in Christ, it will produce a changed life. And on that judgment day, you're going to have evidence that I've changed. That gospel, the kindness of God has been changing me. Not perfection, but there is change. And that's what he's saying, the judgment for us. We're going to be judged in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we're going to get eternal inheritance, but our life is going to authenticate and prove that we've rested in Christ alone and found him to be a savior. Powerful, mighty, hard truths. We're going to keep flushing it out, but I just needed someone to not despair and fall into the pit. Oh no, I'm going to be, I I can only be right with God by my works. No way, no way. And we will flush that out. I'm going to close with one last statement. I think I've said that eight times, but this is the last. And this one, I, I've, I heard it back when I was in seminary. There was a little cathedral in Germany. And it, it's engraved uh, on one of the walls, I believe it is, with these words. And these words say this. Thus speaks Christ our Lord to us. You call me master and you obey me not. You call me the way and you walk me not. You call me the light and you live me not. You call me wise and you follow me not. You call me fair and you love me not. You call me rich and you ask me not. You call me eternal and you seek me not. If I condemn thee, blame me not. I pray that this gospel would cause us to pursue after the the goodness uh, to all men and immortality and and life and honor and that we would be a, a, a people who are different than this world. So let's pursue him in glory and immortality for eternal life. And so let's let God uh, do his work in each one of our hearts now this morning. Father, I pray that you'll take these words and and God, I I know there's going to be believers who are going to despair. They're going to go into Romans 2 and they're going to see their hypocrisy and they're going to want to despair. But this is a, a chapter about repentance and salvation. This is a a message to to let the Word of God open you up. Hold it up to your heart this morning. Oh God, let us see. Let us see what is in it. Not hide and go judge others instead of our own heart, God. Shine. Cut out hypocrisy. Let the kindness that you've given us in Christ stir our affections all the more to run in the ways of Christ to walk in the paths of righteousness, to deviate away from unrighteousness. Oh God, let this sweet gospel have its work in our hearts. And I pray for any unbeliever this morning, God, don't let them misread your patience, thinking that you don't care about the way they're living. God, I pray that they would see this account called wrath being stored up And let them have a little fear of God this morning. But let them flee to the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, let them come to the one who propitiated your wrath. Who emptied the account so that now they could just have the favor and grace of God. And relationship and adoption and beauty. God, let them see that this morning. And it's by turning from this wrong thinking and wrong living. Repenting. And believing in the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished our salvation so that now by faith we could be brought into the realm of salvation. Oh God, bless all in the hearing of the voice and words this morning, I pray. Amen.